CN Web Academy, and we are in the last phase of the season two of the talks. And today we have a very exciting talk uh, by Dr. Uh, Simon Harvey, who is from Australia, and he'll be speaking on epilepsy in uh, tuberous uh, sclerosis in children. And to chair the session, I invite uh, Professor Pratibha Singhai, ma'am, who is uh, who needs no introduction, but uh, still uh, many of the uh, participants, maybe the youngsters who are not aware of the work done by the great stalwarts in our uh, academy. So I would like to just give a, uh, give a brief bio data. So Madam is uh, currently the Director of Pediatric Neurology and Neurodevelopment at Medanta Gurugaon. Uh, and uh, previously she has held the head of department as well as she was uh, uh, the Chief of Pediatric Neurology uh, Division at PGI Chandigarh. And she has always been a topper and has uh, 38 years of rich experience in pediatric neurology. She started the DM Pediatric Neurology Program in uh, Chandigarh. She has been the national president of the Association of Child Neurology India, through which we are now having these webinars. And she has extensive research and publications. She has been as active in pediatric neurology as in the neurodevelopmental disorders. She has received numerous orations and uh, currently, the most uh, uh, honorable position and uh, for which we are really proud of her is that she is the Secretary General of the ICNA, which is the International Child Neurology Association. So over to you, Madam, to conduct the session. Thank you, Kavita. First of all, I must congratulate the AOCN for doing such a splendid series of talks. And uh, it's really my pleasure to be associated with it. I extend a warm welcome to Dr. Simon Harvey, who's uh, the clinical lead of epilepsy and EEG and neurophysiology at the Royal College of uh, Royal Children's Hospital in Melbourne, Australia. He's also an honorary research fellow at the Flory Neuroscience Institute, Murdoch Children uh, Center in Melbourne again. He's been the past president of the Epilepsy Society of Australia and also the secretary of ILAE, Asian Epilepsy Academy. He's actually held so many ILAE task forces, he's headed them. And he's a well-known figure in epilepsy, EEG, epilepsy surgery, etc. Uh, in terms of um, tuberous sclerosis, he has a vast personal experience. He's overseen about 80 surgeries in this field and has four papers and two book chapters dedicated to this. Now today's topic, uh, Dr. Harvey, is a very important topic. We do know that, you know, tuberous sclerosis causes a lot of burden of epilepsy worldwide. And whereas an individual clinician may not see as much, but looking at the overall burden, it's humongous. And epilepsy in TS is almost like ranges from 80 to 90 percent. And there are various studies like TOSCA and in terms of treatment, the exit three, and lots of controversies. So we would like you to shed light on all this, and we welcome you once again. Thank you, uh, Madam Chairperson, for uh, that kind introduction. And uh, thank you to Dr. Kavita and the uh, uh, Academy for the invitation to speak uh, this evening. Um, it's a, a topic that um, I uh, often speak on and uh, um, I uh, uh, keen to share my, my experience and, uh, and my views on management of uh, uh, epilepsy in children with uh, tuberous sclerosis, uh, not just the surgical, which I um, uh, spend a lot of my time in, but also uh, uh, important aspects of, uh, of medical management. Can so, we um, just a I'm going to share my screen now. And, Is everybody hearing him properly? Yes, we are able to hear. Okay, so um, hopefully you're seeing my first uh, first slide. And uh, I thought I would just um, start with a uh, an introductory uh, slide. I'm not going to talk a lot about the clinical features of tuberous sclerosis. We're really going to try and concentrate on epilepsy and uh, particularly uh, aspects of management of epilepsy in tuberous sclerosis. 
So we all know tuberosclerosis is an autosomal dominant neurocutaneous uh, condition where the clinical features uh, are due to hematomas that are widely distributed in uh, multiple organs throughout the body. And the, the CNS um, bears a, a huge brunt of that and the CNS manifestations are, are particularly prominent and, uh, and feature early. And uh, as we all know, often pediatric neurologists are the, are the first people to uh, come in contact with uh, uh, patients with tuberous sclerosis. Um, the, the clinical manifestations, they, they vary widely. They vary widely between patients. Uh, and in familial cases, uh, they can uh, uh, vary widely uh, within uh, family members. Now, the, the genetics uh, of tuberous sclerosis is, has been widely studied. And uh, uh, it seems that with uh, current genetic testing, about 85% of patients say uh, a mutation is identified. The majority of these are in uh, the TSC2 gene that uh, codes the protein tuberin, 20% in the uh, the gene uh, hamilton that uh, can codes uh, the TSC1 gene that codes the protein uh, hamilton But um, in uh, about 10-15% of cases, uh, no mutation uh, is identified and studies haven't actually uh, found a third gene causing tuberous sclerosis, uh, rather they uh, uh, um, deep sequencing will uh, typically find uh, either intronic mutations uh, or mosaicism. And uh, as we all know, these uh, genes are important in uh, regulating the uh, mTOR pathway, which uh, controls uh, important aspects of cell differentiation um, and uh, proliferation. And we'll come back to this when we talk about uh, mTOR inhibitors. So epilepsy uh, is probably the most common clinical manifestation of tuberous sclerosis. Some studies estimating up to 90% of uh, patients uh, uh, with tuberous sclerosis will have seizures and uh, they typically present in childhood most uh, uh, frequently in the first year of life with uh, the peak uh, being uh, around age three, four, five months of, uh, of age. Seizures are typically focal in nature and uh, probably all seizures in tuberous sclerosis have a focal basis but they'll manifest as overt focal motor seizures or uh, discognitive seizures uh, uh, in uh, infants and young children with or without uh, spasms. And about 50% of patients with tuberous sclerosis with epilepsy will have spasms. And um, studies say about 50%, a bit more. I, I think it's uh, probably much more being uncontrolled in uh, tuberous sclerosis and particularly in the population that we see in pediatrics with uh, infant onset, particularly with uh, infantile spasms. Uh, uh, the majority of those uh, patients are refractory to medical management. And in addition to, uh, to seizures, the other major burden in tuberous sclerosis, neurological burden, is uh, uh, that of the cognitive and behavioural impairments. And about 50% of uh, children will uh, have an intellectual disability. Uh, a large proportion of the remainder will have uh, milder cognitive impairments. And about 50% of uh, patients with TS will fulfill diagnostic criteria for autism spectrum disorders. And again, uh, a fair proportion of the remainder will uh, uh, be on the spectrum with milder, uh, milder traits. And what research has told us is that the cognitive and behavioural outcomes for children with tuberous sclerosis is highly correlated with the presence or absence of epilepsy. So the presence of seizures predicts uh, greater risk of cognitive and behavioural impairments particularly early onset seizures, uh, seizures that are uncontrolled, particularly during those early years of life and particularly infantile spasms. I'm not really going to dwell on this uh, except where it relates to aspects of, uh, of treatment. And a large, as a large part of management of seizures in, in children with tuberous sclerosis is not only to control the seizures, but uh, to uh, improve developmental uh, outcomes. I'll just come back to this uh, graph here, which shows the uh, age of onset of seizures uh, in uh, children. And this is from a Boston study. We looked at our series and found a, a similar distribution. So you can see the y-axis, uh, it's broken off there. That uh, first year of life incidence uh, is extremely high. And then the incidence uh, uh, drops off in terms of the onset of seizures. But you can see this looks to be a second, uh, a second peak there. Something changes around uh, uh, three years of age. And there's this 
sort of impression that uh, when you look at this age distribution, uh, not just from this study, but other studies, that maybe it's a bimodal distribution. And my strong impression of children with epilepsy and tuberous sclerosis is they fall into, uh, into two groups that probably relate very much to uh, this uh, bimodal or apparent bimodal distribution and potentially to, uh, to genetics. So the first group, the most uh, frequent group that we see are these uh, infant onset, toddler onset uh, epilepsies. And uh, uh, these uh, are children that typically have um, uh, multivocal seizures, so seizures arising from multiple locations, often with spasms. This is uh, uh, reflected in their EEG. And often we have great difficulty trying to localize seizures clinically and electrically uh, in these uh, patients. And these, uh, these seizures are frequently drug resistant. The, the behavioral and cognitive impairments are, are usually quite severe in this group. And these patients, uh, this sort of early onset group, you know, the majority of these children will uh, carry the TS2 mutation. And when you look at their MRIs, they often have a quite a large, uh, heavy tuber burden with very large tubers, some with a cystic appearance or dysplastic appearance. And they, they often have a lot of abnormal white matter. But in contrast to those are these children that tend to present uh, a little later and, and tend to do so with a, a more typical unifocal epilepsy like temporal lobe seizures or frontal lobe seizures. And often their seizures can be uh, relatively well localized on seizure semiology and on EEG. And this is probably the group where you get uh, uh, greater proportions of, uh, of drug responsiveness. But the behavioral and cognitive impairments are less and this is where you would more commonly find the, the TSC1 uh, uh, mutation. But here the, the tubers, I think, are often of a slightly different appearance. And uh, whereas the tubers in the, in, the, in the younger group are often very obvious on T2 weighted images, sometimes they're, they're less obvious in this group and uh, uh, one needs flare or DWI sequences to pick out what are often sort of little thin, wispy uh, tubers that look like little uh, cortical displasias with uh, radial bands. Just to show the example, here's a, a T2 coronal in, a, in an infant, and these, uh, these areas here are white of the tubers. And every now and then you'll see tubers which have what I'll refer to as a dysplastic appearance, and I'll make reference to the center of tubers, and that's this area here where there's often a little pit. Um, there's low T2 signal, maybe a band passing through it. And it looks like a little cortical dysplasia within a bigger cortical dysplasia. You can see the very abnormal white matter through here, delayed myelination, but also abnormal white matter. But in contrast here, this is a flare sequence. You can see these radial bands that are characteristic, but these are the tubers here, these thin wispy ones going out to the cortical surface. And some of them go to the bottom of sulci and to the appearance of a bottom of sulcus dysplasia. And um, I think patients typically fall into, uh, into one of these, but uh, like with all syndromes, there's, uh, there's overlap. I'll come back to this from time to time. What I'm going to talk about is, uh, is management of epilepsy in children with tuberous sclerosis. And I've broken the presentation up into uh, working through uh, the, the lifespan and degrees of refractoriness. So we'll talk about infantile spasms, treatment of chronic epilepsy uh, with medical and uh, surgical approaches. I've got time at the end. I'll show a couple of, uh, of cases just to, just to wrap up. So infantile spasms occur in 40 to 50% of children um, uh, with uh, tuberous sclerosis, and, and these are highly associated with uh, uh, autism and uh, intellectual disability. Now, the, the, the international guidelines are recommended by Gabatron as first-line uh, therapy for uh, 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 infantile spasms in the context of tuberous sclerosis, not in other settings. So in tuberous sclerosis, this came about because when by Gabatron was uh, uh, was first used in clinical practice and found to be beneficial for, uh, uh, for spasms, the group of infants that had the best outcomes, the best responses to bigabitrin was uh, the group with tuberous sclerosis. Okay? And that sort of stuck. And uh, the, the French sort of whose steroid regimen was to use hydrocortisone showed that bigabitrin was better than hydrocortisone for spasms in general. So we know that hydrocortisone is not that good for spasms in general. There's better treatments, ACTH and high dose oral prednisolone. But unfortunately, this is left by Gabitrin in the realm of being the best treatment for tuberous sclerosis, for, um, for spasms in the context of tuberous sclerosis. 
But spasms in other settings, so due to cortical dysplasias, um, perinatal problems, cryptogenic causes, uh, we know that high dose oral or um, uh, steroids or, or ACTH is more effective than vigabatrin uh, in the, the sort of comparative studies like the UCAS study, but um, steroids combined with vigabatrin seem to be better for controlling um, uh, uh, spasms. Uh, also, the developmental outcomes we know in, uh, in patients treated with steroids for their spasms uh, are better than those for children treated with vigabatrin. But the important point is that these studies excluded children with tuber sclerosis based on this. We don't actually have any studies that compare vigabatrin with uh, proper ACTH or high dose uh, uh, stero oral steroids uh, for spasms. But we continue to use vigabatrin. The concern is that maybe it isn't as good or maybe uh, the developmental benefits that we see with steroids compared to vigabatrin uh, because of better efficacy of the steroids or some beneficial effect of steroids on development, or maybe vigabatrin has some adverse effects on children's development. And this just worries me a little bit that maybe we underuse uh, steroids. And just by way of example, this is a child who uh, uh, presented many years ago, I still look after this child, now 16 years old. Uh, mother brought the child to the hospital, to the emergency department. She'd recognised the child had spasms, recognised that the child had tuber sclerosis from being on the internet. Um, after being treated with vigabatrin, three weeks in, the spasms uh, continued and the developmental arrest that had happened uh, uh, had not reversed. And it was only when uh, oral prednisolone was added to the vigabatrin that the spasms and the hips arrhythmia settled and... Uh, uh, there was a period of, uh, of no spasms uh, well before uh, seizures returned. So what, what I'm saying is certainly use Vigabatrin, but, uh, but certainly uh, uh, check the clinical response and the EEG response and be prepared to uh, add steroids uh, very quickly. So that's the treatment of uh, spasms. So the, the international recommendations are to use uh, Vigabatrin. Uh, all I'm saying is I just to repeat myself is to uh, potentially think about adding steroids if bigabitrin is ineffective. So then we're now just moving along, or moving back a step actually, and we're considering the issue of whether to use bigabitrin earlier than waiting for spasms. And the premise here is that we know that uh, uh, tuber sclerosis can be diagnosed uh, prenatally or, or perinatally uh, in about a third of uh, children. And we also know from serial EEG studies that before the onset of spasms and hips arrhythmia, one sees on EEGs focal spikes, so focal epileptiform discharges interictally, and focal seizures. And these will typically precede, often by just weeks, uh, the onset of, uh, of spasms in an infant. And, and the presence of, of uh, focal uh, EEG changes, both interictal and ictal, is highly correlated with the uh, imminent development uh, of spasms. And that observation led to this study being uh, done. I'm, I'm sure many of you are aware of it. Uh, it's, uh, I think it's a very important study. It's surprising it wasn't published in a, in a higher journal and it's uh, had some important clinical effects. Um, this study was a comparative study where the Polish group, uh, led by Serge Joswiak, uh, looked at the uh, compared uh, historical cohort of children with tuber sclerosis, 31 children who were treated with bigabitrin at the onset of their seizures. Okay, And they compared those with uh, a prospective group going forward where they changed their strategy and they were using serial EEGs. And when they saw abnormalities, interictorictal, on the EEG, they treated those children with bigabitrin, and there were 14 of those children. So it's the same centre, but it's not contemporaneous, okay? And what they, what they noticed was in the historical cohort that of those 31 children, as expected, 71% of them developed seizures in the two years following, right? And a third of those children developed spasms. But in this prophylactic group, preventative group, only uh, less than half of those children develop seizures and only one of the 14 children, 7%, actually develop spasms. And more importantly, they found at, uh, at follow-up that the incidence of later uh, epilepsy was less. So um, uh, 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 
you know, the absence of, of seizures at two years of age and then the months leading up to that, 93%, but only 35% were seizure free in the standard group. But even more important was the developmental outcomes seemed to be different in that the mean IQ, the mean developmental quotient uh, was in the normal range um, uh, for the um, uh, preventative group, okay? And um, the developmental delay was seen in only 14% of that preventative group compared to half of the standard group. A little bit like uh, was seen in the comparison with steroids and uh, uh, vigabatrin in the uh, UK studies. What this has meant is that uh, uh, it's called for and, and, and led to uh, two trials uh, that are actually looking in a, uh, in a parallel design way, a placebo controlled way, whether there is in fact clinical merit from uh, using vigabatrin prophylactically uh, in this same clinical setting to uh, reduce the incidence of epilepsy and improve cognitive and behavioral outcomes. Now the Epistot study has actually finished recruiting and they're starting to publish uh, the, the prevent study in the US, I think is still, uh, is still recruiting. So what do we do now? Well, uh, my advice is that we actually educate our, uh, our colleagues, our, our geneticists, colleagues, cardiologists, and neonatologists who see these, these uh, 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 prenatal and uh, neonatal uh, uh, patients and make diagnoses of TS. And we ask them to refer those patients to us uh, promptly. What we should do with those families is see them promptly or see them in the neonatal nursery and talk to them about tuberous sclerosis, educate them about seizures and the, uh, the, the high rate of seizures and the association that seizures have with uh, poor cognitive outcomes. And we should describe to these families what seizures can look like, particularly in their subtle forms and particularly spasms. And we should have a think about whether we want to take this approach of doing uh, serial EEGs and if we are, whether we're going to uh, act upon them. We need to follow these children very closely. And I think you know, doing monthly EEGs is a way of actually keeping a close uh, contact on the, uh, with, the, with the children, okay? If you're not gonna do EEGs, I think uh, at least uh, see them closely, interrogate the family and uh, check on their developmental uh, uh, progress. And uh, if you're doing uh, EEGs and you find abnormalities, you then need to think about whether you're going to act on that, like uh, in the study from Poland, and that's certainly been my practice to do this and to put children on vigabatrin and to keep them on it for six or 12 months to try and prevent uh, spasms. Or we just wait for the results of these studies. But either way, it's, uh, it's very important to uh, watch these children very closely and uh, at the onset of symptomatic seizures, be they focal or spasms, get these children very quickly onto anti-epileptic medication and start monitoring their development and their clinical response to treatment uh, in terms of seizures and their EEG. And I think what's probably gonna happen is that when these studies come out, I think they're probably not going to show a significant difference because the control arm of these studies are children who are getting equally closely monitored and uh, having EEGs that not, they're not gonna get treated but until the seizures actually start. And for many children, that's a very small window. And these studies are potentially flawed for picking a difference. What makes a big difference is just being very active in your surveillance and jumping on these uh, children uh, with treatment. Okay, so we move along now to uh, the issue of children who have an established chronic epilepsy and uh, uh, how we manage that. And really it's like uh, any other uh, chronic epilepsy with focal or generalized seizures. My impression is probably Tegretol and Trileptal, so carbamazepine and oxcarbazepine and maybe topiramate uh, uh, are slightly better drugs for, for focal seizures in TS, given that we are dealing with, with uh, focal cortical dysplasias. Uh, the children that, you know, who unfortunately do go down the spasms and tonic seizure line and develop a Lennox gasto phenotype, yeah, they obviously are going to need to be treated with valproate, lamotrigine, clobazan, and so forth, sort of Lennox drugs. It is worth keeping in mind by gabapentin again here. So we're using it to treat spasms. We might be using it prophylactically to prevent spasms. But even in, in older children who've had later onset of focal seizures or in the child with chronic uh, refractory focal epilepsy, it might be worth just thinking about revisiting by gabapentin. And uh, but you use it cautiously. You don't want to uh, exacerbate seizures. 
And what we do see are some children where it works in infancy for spasms, but doesn't work later on for, uh, for focal seizures, but certainly uh, worth giving it a go. Uh, we're all using cannabidiol now, or our parents, uh, parents of children are asking us to prescribe it. Uh, there is some experience with it in uh, uh, TS, and like with all drugs, it, um, there is a proportion of the patients where it uh, does make a difference. Um, there is a randomised controlled trial of the Epidiolex uh, formulation, which has uh, finished recruiting, and I suspect we'll see published results soon. And, and that showed, like, uh, like most uh, clinical drug trials in, in various uh, settings, that with CBD, 50% uh, of, uh, this is the uh, median seizure reduction was 49% uh, was in the CBD group and it was 27% in the placebo group. But uh, those that use CBD know that um, there's uh, uh, certainly a lot of side effects with its uh, prescription. Um, ketogenic diet is, uh, is often used and uh, um, you know, typical sort of scenarios, two thirds of patients get an initial response, but only about a third get a sustained response and stay on it. Not dissimilar to uh, uh, the diets use in other chronic epilepsy settings. And the same with BNS, there's a proportion of patients that seem to respond to uh, uh, vagus nerve stimulation who have tuberous sclerosis. Reading the papers and talking to the people from Levanova, they and you know, some of the US people that do a lot of VNS, they suggest that children with TS, in fact, have a higher responder rate than other settings. That, that hasn't been my experience, but I don't use a lot of VNS in this, uh, in this setting. Okay, so coming to the mTOR inhibitors, and this is sort of the, the new kid on the block. This is the um, uh, sirolimus and everolimus. These are uh, drugs that uh, are known to uh, uh, downregulate the mTOR pathway. The genetic defects in the, in the TSC1, uh, TSC2 genes, uh, uh, inter the, the complex uh, interferes with the uh, um, uh, mTOR pathway. Uh, its normal function is to inhibit mTOR uh, with um, loss of function, reduced function of the, of the, of the tuber and Hamilton uh, complex. Uh, there's uh, upregulation of, uh, of mTOR with all the uh, consequent uh, abnormalities that go with it structurally and functionally. And we know that uh, these mTOR inhibitors can uh, reduce the size of Seegers and, uh, and other solid uh, tumors. And uh, uh, many of you I'm sure will have lots of experience with, uh, with using these uh, in that context. But uh, there's also uh, evidence uh, initially from, uh, from open trials, but uh, then finally the RCT, the uh, uh, exist three trial that uh, Adam Chairman uh, mentioned that uh, showed a, uh, a significant response uh, uh, in patients with uh, uh, drug resistant uh, epilepsy due to tuberous sclerosis uh, in a dose related uh, fashion. Uh, again, um, just like using CBD, uh, these medications are not without side effects and uh, many of the patients in the high dose arm um, uh, which were driven uh, up there to show the efficacy had lots of side effects. I had patients uh, in this trial and the clinical experience is often that you only need low doses. My personal experience is that it's, you know, not, not, a, not a great uh, drug for seizures. It, uh, it does reduce seizures in some children to, to modest degrees. There's the occasional child that uh, responds significantly, at least temporarily. Um, I tend to use it after other medical and surgical therapies have failed and uh, often just to um, sort of pick up the remnants of seizures in some of these children, uh, the milder seizures, and it can have beneficial effects for their learning and behavior and autistic features. And I, look, I think we're all gonna have to become very uh, apt at using these, uh, these medications to treat the range of manifestations in tuberous sclerosis. Uh, and I regularly, I think just today, had a, had a couple of children in clinic uh, on these uh, medications. Uh, for those not familiar with using them, um, so Sirolimus has been around for a while. It's the, it's the cheaper agent. Everolimus is the Novartis uh, preparation, which is a lot more expensive, been uh, well studied in clinical trials. Uh, these, these drugs are easy to use. Uh, once daily dosing, fairly linear effects. You aim for uh, uh, drug levels 5 to 15. But as I said, often at the low end of the range, uh, they can be quite effective. They're very well tolerated in low doses and the, the, the side effects are fairly, uh, fairly minimal. Uh, once you've got a patient on an established dose, you can be just doing blood testing every three, four, six months. Um, you're monitoring their weight, uh, their blood pressure and their, their looking for urine protein. Families need to know that when they're unwell, like significantly unwell, or if they're injured, 
hospital if they're having surgery, they need to stop them for a week beforehand and during that illness, and then recommence, say, a week after the surgery or when they've recovered from the illness. Side effects are really minimal. I don't like my patients having any side effects, and I take the doses right down. Intermittent mouth ulcers is all I'll really tolerate. Um, occasionally, you'll get children who end up in hospital or they just they get a cold and they can never quite throw it until they stop the, um, uh, stop the medication. And, uh, you know, there's going to be a whole generation of children, a um, whole decade worth now with tuber sclerosis who've been on these medications and they'll continue on them through adolescence and their, young, their adult lives. And we probably are going to see some side effects down the line related to bone density, um, hyperlipidemia and so forth. Okay, so um, I was going to finish up uh, talking about uh, epilepsy surgery. And uh, this is an area where I've uh, uh, maybe got a bit more experience. Uh, epilepsy surgery is certainly, uh, certainly a very, very difficult area. I'm not going to be going into this in any, any great detail. Um, as we've mentioned uh, through this presentation, uh, at least half of uh, children with tuber sclerosis, uh, their, their seizures are resistant to anti-epileptic medications. If you look at the literature, the studies, uh, the sort of meta-analyses say that about 50 to 60% of patients with TS undergoing surgery are seizure-free at one year. And that's sort of like the figures you would see for temporal lobe epilepsy. However, in these studies, these are very highly selected, typically older children in that sort of second hump uh, of, the, of the curve who've got a sort of a, a temporal lobe epilepsy or a frontal lobe epilepsy uh, with a very obvious seizure focus and tuber, the so-called low-hanging fruit. It gets much more difficult when you go down into the younger children, which is where the potential gains are. If we can control seizures in infancy uh, and early childhood in children where ligabitrin steroids, anticonvulsants are, are, not, uh, are not working. But it's very difficult down uh, in the young paediatric end. It's very difficult to localise seizures it's on EEG and clinically. It's very difficult to see tubers on image or MRIs. And as you remember, that, that first uh, group um, where most of the patients are typically have multiple seizure foci and frequently will need uh, multiple surgeries. So it's a very difficult group to uh, embark on. The other area is uh, that it's, it's a very controversial area as to whether we should be doing surgery in these children or not. But that aside, it's trying to pick which children are, are candidates for surgery and which are not. Um, how do we identify uh, which tubers are epileptogenic and which tubers are not, whether to remove uh, surrounding cortex. These are all very difficult er uh, areas and there are people with very strong views like myself and um, uh, it's an area that's really not, uh, not solved. And that's just gone backwards and forth, there we go. So um, look, my experience uh, uh, is, is fairly vast in this area. We've been doing uh, epilepsy surgery for 20, uh, over 20 years now in children with tuber sclerosis. So, over 80 children with uh, 140 operations. At least half of these children have had their first surgery uh, younger than age three. These are typical hardcore pediatric uh, uh, patients with uh, early onset um, mix of focal seizures and spasms, typically in the context of, uh, of developmental uh, delay. And we do uh, a lot of tuberectomies and uh, we do a lot of re-operations, as you can see there. So uh, more than you know, about half the, the children uh, get away with one surgery, but uh, uh, many need a second, third, and sometimes a fourth surgery. What I will make though is that um, we try and avoid doing intracranial EEG monitoring. And most children that we see, uh, we can have a good stab at fixing their epilepsy by utilizing the scalp EEG uh, MR and maybe some other uh, imaging modalities and uh, without needing to do stereo EEG or subdural EEG monitoring. So the literature would suggest that uh, these children have um, pervasive epileptogenicity and uh, surgery is not going to help them because yes there might be tubers that you can see but there's dysplasia that you can't see, there's this molecular pervasive molecular disturbance, this mTORopathy and all these seizure networks that underpin the EEG uh, disturbance and spasms and tonic seizures that we see. And therefore, it's a pretty hopeless uh, scenario. But that's, this is not our, uh, not our experience. Our experience in research um, suggests that, that seizures come from tubers, and they in fact come from the centres of tubers. And it's in the centres of tubers where that you record these 
focal cortical dysplasia like patterns on uh, EEG, where we see a real density of uh, dysmorphic neurons typical of uh, focal cortical dysplasia. And, and it has this appearance on uh, MRI that looks a bit like a focal cortical dysplasia with, uh, with cortical thickening and blurring of the gray-white junction. The, the surround, the, the rim of the tuber, where we see that prominent white on, on T2, seems to be fairly uh, inactive, uh, sort of rim around it. And when you do see changes in the peritubural cortex, our impression is that this is often just reactive to what's going on in the tubers. So this work comes from uh, uh, studies that uh, a couple of uh, fellows have uh, worked very hard on. Uh, uh, Dr. Ahmad uh, from, uh, uh, from KL uh, did this study, uh, which uh, was published in Neurology, showing that it was the tubers, not uh, peritubural cortex, uh, that was the site of the rhythmic interictal epileptiform discharges and the seizure onsets. And uh, that if there were changes in the peritubural cortex uh, uh, surrounding tubers, this is all tuber here, peritubural cortex here, that these changes were just secondary and reactive to what was going on in the tuber. Another observation that we made at that time was that seizures would spread and uh, we didn't really understand it well at that time, but it, we saw examples of seizures in a tuber spreading to another, another tuber, as you can see here. So spreading from this tuber to this tuber without going through the intervening cortex. Now, it was uh, Dr. Uh, Lakshmi uh, that uh, uh, really took this work further, and uh, this is the brain publication of, of Lakshmi's that looked more closely at the children that had depth and strip electrodes in and uh, working uh, painstakingly through the recordings and, and determining the locations of individual electrode contacts. What this uh, figure shows discharges in the red here, which is the tuber center being recorded from this depth electrode, ictal onset, a recruiting rhythm. Here you can see another tuber, a separate tuber where it's got its own independent interictal discharges coming from the tuber center, not in the rim and the surrounding cortex here. But this, the seizure that started here propagates here and then propagates even further to another tuber. Okay, so this tuber to tuber spread from center to center of, uh, of tubers and a very important observation that underpins what we, uh, what we do. And here's Dr. Lakshmi. So look, I've only got uh, another five minutes. I had a couple of cases, but they, they really just highlight these points. They might be things that uh, we um, uh, can uh, talk about uh, more. Uh, the, the photo here um, just shows many of the fellows and, and visitors from India have come to our department. What, what I might do at, uh, at this point, just to, to, um, to give us lots of time for, for discussion, rather than show the couple of cases that uh, uh, Dr. Dr. Chopra, Saurabh Chopra would be keen to know, they're both patients that he looked after um, uh, uh, just before he left Melbourne. I'll, uh, I'll finish up and um, just uh, wrap up with some sort of summary remarks, just going back through what I've talked about. So I think the, the, the key to, to managing children uh, with uh, epilepsy in the context of tuberous sclerosis is to, is to diagnose and aggressively uh, treat their epilepsy early on. And this requires us to pick up children uh, in, uh, in the newborn period, ideally before the onset of spasms. So at a minimum, we can follow these children closely and, and counsel the families to potentially even pre-symptomatically uh, treat them. We need to be aware, as I said, uh, detects uh, uh, seizures uh, early, uh, most importantly spasms, but also uh, focal seizures and potentially uh, EEG abnormalities using bigabitrin in the first instance, but uh, quickly coming in with steroids uh, in children with uh, persistent spasms and uh, uh, an abnormal uh, EEG. I haven't really mentioned uh, management of the cognitive and behavioural problems. They, they clearly form a, a large part of management and uh, looking after children with uh, autism and intellectual disability and ADHD complicating their tuberous sclerosis. It's a major, major part of management, but please don't fire me questions uh, in the question time about those aspects. I'm uh, very fortunate to be able to uh, share those uh, uh, aspects of care with experienced paediatricians, behavioural paediatricians. What I'd like you to consider is in children and even infants who have uncontrolled uh, uh, epilepsy, drug resistant epilepsy, rather than considering them for a ketogenic diet or CBD or more drugs or BNS, is that you consider these children for epilepsy surgery because it is the, it's the one way that we can uh, uh, stop seizures or at least uh, significantly reduce the seizure burden 
uh, with the impacts that it has on uh, development. The, the mTOR inhibitors, they have a place. They don't really have a place in, uh, in, in infancy. It's very hard to use these medications in infants and toddlers. After about sort of three years of age, you can start using them without the children getting sick all the time. Uh, they're not really great anticonvulsants. They have, a, they have some role to, to play, but they're, they're not going to uh, prevent uh, the serious uh, um, uh, comorbid uh, cognitive behavioural problems that seizures can give rise to. Um, I typically reserve the, the ketogenic diet, uh, other drugs, uh, VNS for children whose epilepsy is not only drug resistant, but surgery resistant. And there's many children who fit in that category uh, where they're continuing to have usually very mild focal seizures after uh, very aggressive therapy of their spasms when they were young and their focal seizures with uh, surgery when they've been a bit older. And I think the impact is, uh, is there. And I, I, I look back to when I was training and, and tuberous sclerosis when you were a teenager and being transitioned to adult care was a child who had uh, typically uh, a Lennox Gasto syndrome, wearing a helmet, profound developmental delay in a wheelchair, lots of facial scars and things from injury. And, and we just rarely see those children now. Uh, they're certainly not children who've been in my care. Children in my care have been very aggressively treated from a very young age. And I have seizure-free children who started out with, uh, with big infantile spasms and focal seizures that were refractory in the first year of life. Um, but there's you know, still plenty of children with seizures and with cognitive impairments, but they're much milder and, uh, and much more manageable. And I think the whole battery of treatment that we have available to us uh, now as pediatric neurologists to manage epilepsy really uh, is uh, having impact. So I'll finish my talk there. As I said, I can uh, answer more questions and um, go over some cases if they're relevant. Um, I thank you for, um, uh, I, I gather many of you probably had to come out of uh, work today and uh, following this, go back to work to finish up. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Harvey, for this very concrete and succinct overview of epilepsy in children with uh, <clears throat> tuberous sclerosis. And I think you clarified many points. Now, one of them being, you know, it's usually, as you said, it's thought that only vigabatrin should be used, but you can certainly try steroids when indicated. Uh, two, to decide, you know, whether the child really needs any mTOR inhibitors, that's one of the things. And when do you, you know, add it? And of course, number three is if you can find a surgically correctable tuber, then to refer for early surgery. I think these are very important points. Of course, we do need to see further results. I know when Paolo Curatalo started long ago about preventive medication, MTS, uh, it was a little, you know, surprising that you would start uh, Vigabatrin in such small children without seizures. But now we are seeing more and more evidence of that. And hence, whether you know, we should actually embark on this also is one of the very important issues. So I think you made very several important points and it was really a to the point um, talk, which is very nice. So with that, I would leave it to the moderator to start with the question and answers. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, thank you, Dr. Harvey, for such a comprehensive uh, talk. Wish uh, we had some more time for your cases also. Uh, but it must be getting very late for you. So I'll quickly uh, ask uh, some of our Indian colleagues to share their experience, and then we'll go to the question answers. So Dr. Lakshmi, can you unmute yourself? Yeah, ma'am, I'm here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you briefly share like how many cases of tuberous sclerosis um, in surgery has been done in your center, and what has been your experience uh, regarding uh, tuberous sclerosis? Yeah. First of all, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Simon Harvey for his uh, excellent uh, talk, as always been. And uh, it's a very uh, important topic for all of us pediatric neurologists to uh, update ourselves with the most recent things in the uh, tuberous sclerosis. Thank you, uh, Simon. Um, like uh, following uh, Dr. Simon Harvey's uh, footsteps, we learned a, a lot of these uh, uh, techniques, how to uh, localize these um, uh, uh, epileptogenic tubers by non-invasive non techniques, just a scalp video EEG and the clinical epileptology 
to localize and lateralize these uh, seizure focus and we come to a region okay this is the seizure focus on the right uh, frontal then we look at the candidate tubers in the right frontal maybe there are three or four uh, tubers there so using the such kind of non invasive techniques and then intra operative uh, electrocorticography i have uh, used a strategy uh, similar to uh, rch melbourne we have operated six patients in uh, uh, in the last 4 uh, 5 years in uh, uh, chennai and uh, they are all doing completely well including uh, all six pa patients are uh, seizure free and uh, we use similar technology similar technique of intraoperative uh, electrocardiography to um, localize the bottom of sulcus dis dysplasia also so the same technique what we used for tubers and tuber centers the section we used in uh, bottom of sulcus dysplasia also again dr simon harvey is one of the uh, uh, proponents and uh, the pioneers of bottom of sulcus dysplasia so we could uh, make difference in many of the young kids uh, Uh, life and uh, quality of life by using this uh, technique by curing these uh, uh, drug resistant epilepsy in them having said that we have many patients with tuberous sclerosis even though it's a rare disease so many of the kids in our follow up uh, at the moment i have 15 kids with uh, tuberous sclerosis they are all doing very well with medicines alone and they are not ideal surgical candidates so we are managing these patients with the medicine with vigabatrin without vigabatrin with other antiepileptic medicines also so it's not that we do surgery for all the patients only when we find a, a selective ideal candidate we go for surgery there are other patients they are well controlled under uh, antiepileptic medications as well so we have to look at the uh, whole child as a uh, whole yeah uh, thank you dr lakshmi uh, dr sandeep uh... Can you uh, hi, ma'am. Yourself, yeah, yeah. Yeah, am I audible? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. So, what is your experience? You have uh, recently, I think, started the tuberous sclerosis clinic at your yes, center, yeah, which yeah. also has epilepsy surgery center. So, how many kids you have used epirolimus or uh, like as Dr. Harvey has mentioned, the different kinds of uh, treatment modalities yes. available? Yes. Can you just give a brief overview of your work in tuberous sclerosis? Yes. Uh, first of all i would like to thank simon because it is always a privilege uh, lis listening to him and uh, what lakshmi has correctly said whatever we are learn our epileptology from simon it's with us and we are using it here in india with a good uh, outcome uh, so we started ts clinic uh, in 2018 and so far uh, we have almost 40 patients register in our ts clinic and uh, we have operated on 10 uh, tsc patients so what our experience is uh, we found that there is a good outcome in patients who has got as lakshmi was suggesting bottom of sulcus dysplasia like tubers and having unifocal semiology so those are the candidates where you have the best outcome with epilepsy surgery and but uh, somehow like i would like to know from simon as well uh, the kids with infantile spasm and multiple tubers you tend to have difficulties while you know uh, when we go ahead and do surgery in those patients uh, i would like to know how simon go about these patients where refractory spasms you use vigabatrin steroids and still a child is having spasms and uh, then you operate and still the sometimes they don't uh, respond to the surgery as well so i know uh, i would like to know from simon how he go, goes about this refractory infantile spasm patient and everolimus i used in one patient uh, so we are using uh, it and also i would like to uh, highlight that uh, three of my tsc patients are taking uh, are in a uh, surveillance uh, for uh, uh the surveillance for the uh, uh uh surveillance eeg so what we have done is uh, these three patients we have followed them up from uh, infancy uh, and we are doing serial eeg on them and uh, as simon suggested that you know we can treat them aggressively uh, once you see the uh, epileptic form activity on eeg so these three kids are under surveillance uh, but i would uh, like to know from simon about these refractory infantile spasm patients thank you um so yeah i mean they're the hardest patients to manage the um Um, so we're talking about a, an infant, often with a high tuber load, 
who's um, had seizures through early infancy and often we're seeing them late infancy or second year of life and uh, you know, at that point, all you've got is a very delayed um, autistic looking um, infant toddler um, with seizures that are essentially just spasms with no other clinical focal seizures, EEGs that look pretty horrendous with multifocal epileptiform activity, generalized fast activity. Um, so we would still tackle those children. And I, I, I think the most useful piece of information is uh, the earliest EEGs. And um, I know patients in India often travel around, but if you have the opportunity to um, find the earliest EEGs, uh, and it may just be the first EEG the patient had, um, but in the child that say had focal seizures uh, before they had spasms, that would be a very valuable piece of information. Uh, the follow-up EEGs on treatment. So when you put a child on bigabitrin or on steroids, an EEG that's done a couple of weeks later, we tend to do it routinely just to check on, on follow-up of those. Those EEGs bef before the spasms or just after the spasms were treated can have focal features in them that are very useful. Uh, and obviously the tide then comes back in and all that focality goes away and everything becomes generalised. So try and hunt down those EEGs. And then you're looking at the MRI and uh, it's picking out dysplastic tubers and these, this particular patient group often has many tubers, big tubers, several of them dysplastic. Um, but if you've got a large tuber load on one side and maybe some motor features that are a bit lateralizing to that side and early EGs that are pointing to a side, we would just take that and go and take out either the whole tuber or the centers of a whole lot of tubers in a region. And the premise is, is that tubers have no function in them, these big hard rock-like tubers in this particular patient group. Uh, you won't get problems taking out tubers unless you're careless doing it, but you know, what you can do to minimize resection is just take out the centers. And we've certainly had some children over time where the approach we've said is that we don't know where these tubers are coming from except they're in the right hemisphere. And there's a whole lot of tubers and most of them are on the convexity and they're accessible. And I can think of children where we've just taken them to surgery uh, and in one surgery done two craniotomies, large craniotomies, and just recorded from the centres of tubers and just resected the centres of active and sometimes inactive ones. And you do the child a benefit by removing a whole lot of generators of seizures. And it's a little bit like, you know, groups that have patients that they think have focal epilepsy, but they've got Lennox Gasto. They do a callosotomy and suddenly focality is revealed and seizures are improved and then you can, then you can get going. And uh, I've had, had many of those patients. I, I wouldn't give up on those patients. You, you can, you've got a lot to, lot to gain and not a lot to lose from taking out tubers or the centers of tubers. Okay, thank you, Simon. Thank you, Dr. Harvey and Dr. Sandeep. Uh, we also have with us uh, Dr. Padnya Gargil with us. She has actually uh, helped in opening a string of uh, tuberous sclerosis uh, clinics all over the country. And uh, uh, Padnya, can you unmute yourself? Hello, Pradnya. Pradna, we are not able to hear you. Hello? No? Yeah, Pradna. Okay. Um, yeah, can you just share your experience of, uh, like, uh, what has been your experience of uh, these uh, clinics? And do you think we are still, you know, missing a lot of opportunities to diagnose these patients early and landing up with a whole lot of seizure burden? And uh, even though we have uh, very few epilepsy centers, uh, pediatric epilepsy center, uh, surgery centers in our country. How do you look at the whole thing now with even Vigabatrin not available? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, thank you, Kavita. Thank you, Dr. Harvey, for a very elegant talk on epilepsy in TS. Um, Kavita's nailed it. The problems in managing epilepsy um, uh, are because of uh, lack of uh, early diagnosis. And I think that boils down to the lack of awareness, um, lack of surveillance uh, protocols in most uh, centers. Um, so though we have so much exciting evidence coming around early vigabatrin, the mTOR inhibitors and epilepsy surgery in TS, 
um, I think there is still a huge treatment gap. Um, we're not able to reach out um, uh, to as many patients as possible. You've heard the numbers here. Um, I've operated just about on three cases of uh, TS in all these uh, in all these years. Um, so the numbers are in in you know single digits, um, whereas the potential is much more um, higher. I, can I ask one question to Dr. Harvey, uh, her burning question with respect to epilepsy surgery? Yeah, please go ahead, go ahead. Um, Dr. Harvey, um, uh, the, uh, the most difficult cohort uh, of patients in epilepsy surgery in TS is where the families ask you the question saying, yes, you've localized the epilepsy to this one tuber, but the MRI shows other tubers. Down the line, what is the chance that my child will keep getting, the epilepsy will relapse? Um, from the other tubers, which right now do not show much evidence of epileptogenicity. I find that to be one of the hardest questions to answer, especially in kids where we have a very strong uh, hypothesis and you know you can really help the child. I don't think it happens as often as you worry about. I think if in infancy, it's a different matter because there's a lot of evolution you know, to go on. But if you're talking about a five-year-old who's got an established focal epilepsy, it's... Uh, um, it's not that common when you've got a, a, a toddler, um, particularly with an undifferentiated type of seizure, just sort of staring and a bit of a half smile. You know, you often see a couple of active areas uh, on the on the on the workup and go for one sort of tuber. But there may be a couple of uh, tuber net tubers, um, tuber clusters that are contributing to fairly similar bland sort of seizures, and it might actually take a couple of operations. So. Um, I, I think it's important not to worry about that. And I think uh, my experience is that children that we operate on and we do uh, a first surgery on, uh, those families come running back to us when it either hasn't worked or there's a, a slightly different seizure or a completely new seizure because their experience is that they've seen medications not work and, uh, and, and seen um, you know, epilepsy surgery work in TS. And, and I think a lot of epilepsy surgery does provide benefits. You don't, you shouldn't set the bar so high as to say making the patient seizure free. So right. Dr. Lakshmi's got six from six. So he's either uh, a, a much better epileptologist than, uh, than I am, which may, may be the case, or he's, uh, uh, you know, not taking enough risks and things. So I think my, my line to all my fellows and things is, uh, you know, your epilepsy surgery program should only be running about 50% seizure free because if it's better than that, you're not offering enough surgery because we get so many children that we don't offer surgery to may well benefit from something fairly simple and straightforward. Mm -hmm. so, so if you've got a child who has a particular seizure that's localized to an area, yes, there's lots of other tubers, but if they're not currently active, just, just deal with what's in front of you. And uh, if you fix up that problem um, and some seizures come back, that family won't be down on you because it was it failed. They'll be knocking down on your door to say, "Can you come and fix this new seizure problem?" Um, right. And uh, and generally, even we, we we not infrequently operate on children, and we haven't got the localization right. But but just taking epileptogenic tubers out of particularly these young children can really make a difference. It makes them alerter, brighter. Their EEGs quieten down. And sometimes focality becomes a bit, a bit more obvious, and get it right and do a better job with the second surgery. Right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, uh, Pragna, for joining. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Harvey, for the response. Uh, now we'll go to the question answer sessions. Uh, yeah. Kavita, can I yes, can I just ask a question before we open it to the floor? Yes, ma'am. Sure. Uh, since we were talking about the refractory infantile spasms and you know, normally without uh, tuberous sclerosis, one would possibly do a callosotomy. But how about, uh, you know, where you said you have multiple tubers here and there and not localized, not, you're not able to localize. Would a callosotomy in, be indicated in such children even if they have tuberous sclerosis? Would that help? Look, I, I think if they have, that's um, a good question. I, I think if, if you've monitored them and they're having classic chronic seizures, and um, so clinically and electrically with uh, electrodectrements. Um, look, it, it, 
it's not inappropriate if there's no standout tuber. I think if it's a, a Lennox gasto tonic seizure problem and there's a there's a standout tuber and other evidence that points to it, I would say no. Don't worry that it's a, you're looking at a generalised tonic seizure. Treat the focal process. But but if it's as you're suggesting, it's it all looks pretty hopeless. Look, it's you probably do a better job the patient having a callosotomy than having a VNS or um, uh, you know, more anti-epileptic medication or an mTOR inhibitor. So I would in that setting. And then it may well be that it's like, the example I was giving was not really in a TS setting, in, in settings where um, people have, suspect someone has focal epilepsy, but they can't localize it and end up doing a callosotomy. So it could potentially then reveal focality that you then go, go forward with. Thank you. Okay, so we go to the question answer. Dr. Harvey, are you there with us for another half an hour? We have around 24 questions. Okay. So the first question is, uh, when we are talking about the EEG surveillance in the infants, how frequently should we do the EEG? Yeah, so I was keen to come back to, to this. And um, um, the, 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 we don't have to worry at the moment about whether we should or should not be giving vigabatrin. Okay, I, it's been my practice to do it. And um, I think it has helped patients, but I think that what has really helped them is just seeing the patients and watching them very closely and doing EEGs. And even if you don't act on it, the fact that if you are doing EEGs and, and the recommendation from I think the trials, they were doing them six weekly, I would do them four weekly. So if you're picking up a patient in the newborn period, I might do them every four weeks for the first three months and then every six weeks for the next three months. So that gets them you know, through to about nine months of age and then maybe every couple of months after that and stop at about a year of age. Um, so so uh, monthly to start with, um, six weekly, then two monthly, something like that spread out through the first year of life. But, but just the process of, of taking that active interest, of doing those EEGs and then finding that the patient may well be having seizures on the EEG gets you going on treatment. But if, if you're just seeing focal epileptiform discharges, then you're going to keep watching that patient very closely because you know they're at high risk of developing spasms and so forth. But you're already setting up lots of good things that are going to impact on seizure control and improve that child's development. Because even if you don't put the child on vigabatrin when you first see some right temporal discharges, um, it's probably okay, and then you'll do another EEG and it might show some right and some left-sided ones, but still no seizures, as long as the child's not having clinical seizures, visual regards very good, and so forth, you might be able just to keep watching that child. But if you start recording electrographic seizures, definitely if the child starts having clinical seizures, spasms or focal, or if that child's you know, development just seems to be going off course, then you're there at that moment and you're going to start treatment and that child's going to benefit from it. And the point I was making before is that I, I think when these studies come out, what they're going to show is that there's, there, there, is not a ben there is not a significant difference between the treat with vigabatrin versus keep watching and treat clinical seizures when they come because the time interval is so different, is so narrow between that occurrence and just the mere fact that you're doing such close surveillance uh, is, is what's uh, uh, making a, a difference and jumping on uh, clinical seizures when they start. So I would recommend doing it uh, four weekly, uh, say for the first, you know, every month for the first three months, then six weekly for the next um, three months, so two of those and then maybe um, two monthly thereafter. Yeah, thank you. Uh, what What is the options if we don't have vigabatrin? Because currently we are facing a huge problem uh, of availability. So is there any drug near to vigabatrin in, uh, in terms of efficacy? You don't, you, don't have, you don't have generic vigabatrin in uh, India? Yeah, we are not getting it since last almost five, six months now. Oh, really? That's, that's, that's a problem, yeah. Um, I, was, uh, I was just looking into all this vigabatrin stuff recently and um, I didn't get to the American meeting uh, last year, but I um, came across information presented at that meeting from the American registry, which seems to debunk um, uh, a lot of the uh, data about uh, uh, visual field defects. And it's, I've, I've never had a child with visual field defects and uh, um, any, any clinically significant ERG change or anything. And the 
information coming out from the US would seem to uh, be supporting that. So I think we've worried too much about using bigabitrin. And I think we should get back into using bigabitrin much more for TS, but also cortical dysplasias and other epilepsies. It was a good focal seizure drug when we were using it a lot. And if we start using it more and more, maybe the drug companies and the generic manufacturers will uh, uh, get back into its manufacture. Um, if, you, if you can't use bigabitrin for spasms, then definitely use steroids and you might be doing the patient uh, a better service, the treatment of their spasms at least. Okay. Uh, what is the like, effect of uh, bigabitrin? Uh, because it said that uh, it does not affect the epileptogenesis. Then how do we explain the you know, uh, betterment of the EEG as well as better cognitive outcomes and uh, uh, especially uh, in terms of spasms? Yeah, so I mean, it doesn't, doesn't affect epileptogenesis, it, um, it, meaning it doesn't um, uh, have an effect on the uh, mTOR pathway. I actually did see a study which uh, reported that there is some effect of bigabitrin on, uh, on, on mTOR, but that, that's not the actual way it works. It, look, it's a, um, it's, it's a GABAergic uh, drug. It's, a, uh, it's an irreversible uh, inhibitor of uh, GABAtransaminase. Um, it's, it's, it just does its job. It says, although it's GABAergic, it's very different to benzodiazepines in, in how it works. Um, it's probably got some other actions, but look, it, it stops the seizures and it normalizes the EG. And we know that, uh, that that's what leads to the improved outcomes. If we can, if we can treat spasms uh, and the hypsarrhythmia going with it uh, sooner and more effectively, uh, that's what correlates with the, uh, with the better outcomes. Um, so it's, it's really just an, an anti-seizure, an, you know, anti-hips arrhythmia, anti-generalized epileptic encephalopathy drug, and that's what's uh, leading to the improvements. And, and steroids uh, are better at doing that than bigabitrin in other settings. Um, uh, a problem might be, though, with bigabitrin is that whilst it's it's pretty good at, at stopping spasms and, and the associated EEG abnormalities. It does have some detrimental effects. And we, we see that in the babies being floppy. Um, you see it in the children that you do treat prophylactically when you take them off by Gabitrin after six, 12 months, they actually brighten up and make progress in the development. And the parents look back on by Gabitrin negatively because they never saw spasms. They never saw their baby go off. They actually look back on it negatively. And, uh, and we know, of course, that it can have those changes on the basal ganglia and uh, brainstem um, with restricted diffusion. So, so bigabitrin does have some negative effects. They're overshadowed by its, uh, its positive effects. There is something special about it uh, um, in, in TS, but, but it's also very effective, not just for, for epilepsy related to tubers in TS. It's also very effective for, for just those big solitary tuber-like uh, FCD 2Bs that we see, and also in cortical dysplasias generally. I, I, would, I would always consider using uh, bigabitrin in patients with FCD if there's some reason not to be operating on them. Okay. The next question is, uh, are there any predictors for response to mTOR inhibitors? Not that I'm aware of. Uh, so if you mean a seizure response, um, uh, I mean, the higher the level you achieve, the greater the anti-seizure response, but so are the side effects. Uh, the drugs interact with enzyme inhibitors, so it's really messy using an mTOR inhibitor for a child with TS who has epilepsy who's also on oxcarbazepine or carbamazepine. You need to get them off. You can't use them, you just need to use much higher doses and it's more expensive for the family. Um, I, I'm not aware of, of any, any predictors, I don't haven't read anything, somebody else might, might know. Um, I generally, generally, I think that I have a lot of children on them, but I, I'm not using them as, as my weapon for treating severe uh, developmentally impacting epilepsy with spasms and bad EGs in early childhood. It's just, it's just not going to work there. I use it in the older children who've got milder forms of epilepsy and I'm often looking to get children on it, so I almost you know, want them to have a small seizure that I can put them on it, and uh, uh, because I know it often has other benefits. So many children, their communication and their behaviour will be a bit better. 
on these mTOR inhibitors that are being prescribed for their seizures or their seizures. Not hearing anybody at the moment. Uh, I think uh, Kavita got disconnected. So there are a few more questions, Simon, if you can uh, spend a few more uh, minutes with us. So why are uh, mTOR inhibitors stopped before surgery? Do they inhibit with the healing? Yeah, so um, uh, they, so the, the, the drug was developed as um, an antifungal drug, I think it was found uh, naturally occurring and then developed and had some antifungal uh, use. It um, subsequently um, was shown to act on the uh, mTOR pathway. And as most of you will know, largely used uh, in transplant medicine and in, um, in, in oncology, really as adjunctive therapies to other uh, stronger immunosuppressants and uh, chemotherapeutic agents. Um, but uh, they, they lower your white cell count. So you, know, you need to watch the neutrophil and, and lymphocyte count and um, they, phase of effects in the body, um, you know, the mTOR pathway is a normal pathway and uh, rapidly proliferating cells like, uh, say, white cells are um, uh, affected by, uh, by mTOR. You monitor patients uh, for their um, uh, white cell counts, uh, particularly when you're titrating the drug up. Um, uh, the, the wound healing side, if you, so if a, if a child uh, is burnt, gets a burn, or has a broken limb, um, or has a laceration, or has surgery, they need to stop it until it's healed. So a, a broken bone in a child with tuberous sclerosis on an mTOR inhibitor is six to eight weeks off the drug. And if it's for a SEGA, SEGAs grow back in weeks. So we've seen children who, who we stop the, uh, their mTOR inhibitor that's for their SEGA, we stop it a week before we do surgery for their tuberectomy and their SEGA can grow significantly in a, in a week or two. Yeah. Uh, next question is from uh, Dr. Uh, Rajesh Udani. Uh, I quote his um, wordings. Great talk, uh, Simon. Any comments on uh, SEEG study by Neil? The two types of epileptic tubers, one from the tuber center versus where the epileptogenicity was more in the peri peritubular cortex where the results were less helpful. Do you see many of the later? I mean, the epileptogenicity more and more in the peritubular cortex, do you see many of them later? So Andrew Neal is from Melbourne. Um, I know Andrew well, we meet regularly. He's a huge stereo EEG advocate. Um, as Lakshmi and others know, I'm, I'm not. Um, I'm not a big fan of intracranial EEG. Um, I don't think that's a wise healthcare investment in India either. Um, Andrew worked at Lyon and uh, did some did a study when he was there in older children and adults and things uh, there. Um, look, the issue with any intracranial EEG study is sampling. Um, you know, you're only going to record activity where you've got the electrodes. And the, the problem with stereo EEG is they're single point sources, and you might have a centre of a tuber here or a rim there. Lakshmi will know from his studies that we covered these tubers in three dimensions. They had a grid uh, all over the peritubural, all over the peritubural cortex, the actual tuber, and then a depth electrode into the, into the center. So we this sort of three dimension of a tuber and then the same for various tubers. Stereo EEG, you're spreading it out and certainly don't have the contacts. I'm a firm believer that the action is in the, in the center of these things. The, um, the difference and, and this sort of center rim business is most applicable to what we see in pediatrics. So it's that, that group that have the TSC2 type big rocky tubers. The ones that have the, the sort of older children with the more sort of um, classical focal epilepsy that have the wispy FCD like tubers that look like multiple FCD type patients. Um, in those, the whole dysplasia is is epileptogenic. So one of the cases I was gonna show you was one of these. But in fact, what that is, that's the equivalent of the center of these other ones. Now I'm getting into something pretty complicated here, but um, to answer Rajesh's question uh, and, and um, 
Andrew agrees that the stuff that, that we've reported, he agrees with, even though it doesn't come out as, as clearly in, in that paper. Um, but uh, look, if you just stick to, stick to resecting tubers, not peritubural cortex, that's the main thing. Don't ever go removing normal looking cortex. Just stick to the tuber and have a look in the center before you take out the whole tuber. Maybe take that message away. Yep. Next couple of things there, uh, Lakshmi, did you want to? Yeah, uh, uh, basically, uh, the question here is, uh, it's not surprising that we are going to see uh, the epileptron discharges in the peritubular cortex. It's not surprising at all. Having seen a lot of secondary epileptogenesis stuff going on and uh, secondary uh, generalized symptomatic epilepsy discharges going on. But the question is, where do they arise? That's what uh, we have been shown, like many of the times, the origin, the pacemaker, the driver of these discharges have been in the center of the tuber. Obviously, they would spread to the rim, the, they would spread to the peritubular cortex. So just by finding the discharges in the peritubular cortex does not mean they arise there. Yeah. So the, the, the changes in the peritubular cortex that we see is not specific to tuberous sclerosis. So we all see children who have a focal cortical dysplasia or a DNET and they're having spasms or tonic seizures and you do their EEG and they've got generalized slow spike wave. All that activity is not coming from the lesion. That's coming from either the surrounding cortex or deeper structures that in a, in a secondary fashion, as Lakshmi was saying, it's a, it's a secondary process. Um, either local secondary epileptogenesis or generalized secondary epileptogenesis. And that is being generated independently in the surrounding cortex. But it doesn't mean you have to resect that cortex. Surgery is about making the patient seizure free, not about having a nice tidy e ECOG at the end of surgery. So we, we have lots of surgeries where we take out the lesion and there's still very abnormal epileptic activity in the surrounding cortex. And we just pack up and go home. And we, we know that, that that will settle down in the weeks uh, following. And when you do your post-op EEG uh, a couple of months later, it's going to be normal and that child will be seizure free. Talking about a solitary FCD type patient or tumor patient. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Kavita, are you there? Would you please take over? So, um... Yeah, I'm, I'm there, but I, I think the video has been... Uh, Dr. Lakshmi, I think you continue because I'm not able to see the questions. So, I'm just joining through my phone. Sure, ma'am. Uh, Dr. Singhi, ma'am. I, I don't see any more open questions. Do you? Uh, there are a few, few more, ma'am. Okay, so carry on. Uh, next, a couple of questions about Everolimus. Basically, do you give Everolimus only for seizures? Is patient without setup? And another one is, do you use Everolimus in infantile spasm? Yeah, so, um, so Everolimus and Sirolimus are, are indicated for various uh, solid you know, tumor, hematoma uh, aspects. So, you know, we, we as neurologists use it for SEGA, uh, the renal physicians use it for AMLs, pulmonary physicians uh, use it for LAM. Um, the dermatologists use topical mix it in cream and uh, and rub it on the uh, facial angiofibroma. So but as, as neurologists, we need to be proficient because we're, we're seeing these children, uh, uh, you know, prescribing the cream and uh, using it for SEGA. So I've got, you know, plenty of SEGA patients who are on it. Uh, many where that's their primary problem, but, but many also where they've got epilepsy and I've been managing epilepsy and that's been the first five years of their life and in the next five, 10 years, there's a SEGA growing and we deal with that with Everolimus or Sirolimus. Uh, some of those children ultimately needing, uh, needing surgery. Um, but we similarly also do use it for children who only have epilepsy um, and it is indicated. So the, 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 the paper, the EXIST3 paper showed it was effective and led to licensing in uh, many countries. And uh, so you can use it to treat seizures uh, in TS without SEGA. But as I was saying in my presentation, it's not a very effective treatment for severe epilepsy. If you've got a child with a fairly mild form of focal seizures that you're just trying to sort of get rid of and improve the situation, yeah, you might find it works in that setting and helps, or you might find it only helps a little bit 
that the child's learning or communication or autistic behavior improves uh, significantly. And parents like these mTOR inhibitors when the children are on it, but not for spasms. It, it, there's no trial showing any effectiveness in spasms. Um, it's unlikely to have any, any effect there because the spasms are not due to the mTORopathy. The spasms are due to, like any child with spasms, uh, development doing whatever it's doing in terms of how the brain's wiring up and there's some structural abnormality in the brain be it a focal cortical dysplasia or a tuber or areas of um, you know neonatal hypoglycemic brain injury and that's what causes the spasms and we need medical treatments to get rid of those so it wouldn't it wouldn't work there and then finally it wouldn't be tolerated you couldn't give a baby that uh, the dosing the side effects the prone to infections. I mean, steroids are bad enough, but using uh, Everolimus would be very, very, very difficult. Not used for spasms. Yeah. One last question is about AMT PET in identifying the culprit tuber. There are a couple of questions that have been already well covered in the previous questions on the talk. So we will end with this question, AMT PET. Yep. So the, the data on AMT PET, uh, as you know from uh, uh, Harry Chugani, is, uh, is very compelling. And uh, I'm a strong believer in it. I've seen it. And, and what I'm being interested in is when you, when you see these scans, the, the increased uptake of the AMT is only in certain tubers. And it does correlate highly with the other real markers, which are the EEG activity. So rhythmic spiking uh, in, uh, the sort of continuous rhythmic spiking that characterizes epileptogenic tubers and FCDs correlates with uh, uh, AMT uh, uptake. So um, it, it's a very real thing. The, the problem is that uh, it's only available in, in very few centers. So wherever Harry's working currently, um, uh, in Detroit, uh, Montreal, is there anywhere in India that, that has a Pet facility with uh, the radio pharmacy to make AMT. It's a, it's a carbon 11 isotope as well, and we have no personal experience with it in Australia. Uh, as far as we are aware, uh, there's no center in India that would use uh, yeah. or produce AMT. But if you've got a if you've got a family that's um, able to travel, you know, when we're over this uh, pandemic and has uh, enough money to go and see Harry Chigani, wherever he is, uh, by all means, that would be money very well spent. Uh, I've seen some Australian patients, uh, not mine, but my colleagues interstate, um, uh, Sandeep might, uh, I think probably would have seen a couple of children from uh, Brisbane that, that went overseas and had, um, had AMT PET. Very, very useful investigation. The other investigation that's useful is MEG, and where you're looking at trying to see the source of the rhythmic spikes. So the, the, the scalp EEG marker that we're interested in is not the sort of multifocal, generalized, polyspike way, the real nasty stuff. What we're interested in is, is focal slowing uh, in the background EEG and trains of rhythmic uh, sharp wave spikes and things, just like with an FCD. And if you try and find you know, where the source of that is from uh, MEG, uh, that's uh, useful also. Um, if you can't do MEG and you can do high density EEG with source localization, uh, equally useful. Uh, thank you, Simon, for that uh, excellent talk and uh, spending a lot of time discussing the questions. Now I would like to hand over the mic to the moderator and the chairperson. Yeah, thank you, Lakshmi, for bailing me out. And uh, suddenly my uh, net just went away with the electricity. Uh, thank you, Dr. Harvey. And I think it was an excellent talk followed by lots of question answers, uh, which uh, really cleared our doubts. And uh, uh, we are also thankful to you for allowing us to record this talk. And this talk will be put on the website, AOCN website for everyone to view later. So thank you very much. I think it must be quite late over there. And uh, I thank uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Pratibha Singhai ma'am also to join and all the panelists, Dr. Lakshmi, Dr. Pradnya, Dr. Sandeep for sharing your experience here. And I think it was a sort of a uh, Melbourne reunion for you all. <laughs> okay. So thank you again, everyone. Thank you, all the participants. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Harvey, once again. Thank you so much. Good. Yeah. Good evening. Good night.